What can cave formations tell us about ancient climate on Earth? Well, this coming October at the Geological Society of America's National GSA Connects 2025 meeting, there is a field trip and topical session where participants will get to explore multiple cave systems in Texas and hear about the ongoing research in these caves that aims to reconstruct Earth's ancient climate. And today, I got to sit down with some of the scientists leading this session field trip to answer all of your cave questions. So let's jump into the conversation. Let's first start with probably a question that I think is on everybody's mind watching this, and that is, how exactly do cave formations like stalagmites and stalactites tell us about past climate? Sure. Well, speleothems in general, which stalagmites and stalactites are particular kinds of, formed from dripping water coming into the cave. So our goal is to figure out from what gets encoded in this mineral formation, how much of that water signal is encoded in the calcite, and how much does that water signal then reflect what was maybe happening in the atmosphere above the cave. The simplest proxy, I think, for someone to conceptualize, and that's a physical proxy of the growth rate. So all other things being equal, if it rains more, the water drips faster into the cave, lands on the formation more frequently, so therefore it deposits more calcite in a given amount of time, like in a year, right? On the other hand, if there's an extended drought for years, decades, etc., then the formations will not get dripped upon as much and they'll grow more slowly. That's kind of like how tree rings work too, if we're familiar with that. But now the chemical proxies, potentially yield more information, but they all come with their complexities. We can get into the complexities later, but you know, simply there are things like the isotopes of oxygen, which is in the rainfall, the H2O, and it winds up getting into the calcite of the stalagmite, which is CaCO3, right? That oxygen isotope signal from the rain may get incorporated into the layers of the, of the calcite year by year as they grow. And uh, it may tell us about how much rain there is, the temperature of the rain, and other factors that can change the oxygen isotope signal, if you will, during the meteorological cycle. And then there are other geochemical proxies, such as uh, trace metals, things like strontium, magnesium, that substitute for the calcium in the CaCO3. And the way they substitute is dependent upon what's happening as raindrops flow through the soil, then through the limestone above the cave, and finally in the cave, and as it's flowing over formations on the ceiling before it drips off. All of these can change by various factors of reactions between that water and minerals could change the amount of those different elements. And then there's another isotopic system we apply quite a bit. It's the strontium isotope system. Unlike rainfall, the strontium isotopes are very, there's very little strontium in the rainfall, unlike oxygen. So the strontium that winds up getting into the cave comes from the soil or the limestone. And they have, the soil and the limestone, have different isotopic signals. And we actually use that to reconstruct what the flow paths are. A very fast flow path through the limestone that may happen during very wet periods uh, may only pick up largely a soil signal. On the other hand, uh, during a very dry period, the water tends to follow very diffuse or spread out through microscopic torturous pore pathways. And that gives it ample time for that water to react with the limestone, so then the water may have more of a limestone signal. So that's sort of an independent way to tell dry from wet periods. We use all these geochemical proxies and use them as sort of independent checks on each other. And hopefully they all give us the same answer. We Then we're on to something. So cool. So with that, let's now jump into kind of the title of this topical session. So the title, Monitoring the Veda Zone and Karst, Advancing Studies of Paleoclimatology, Hydrogeology, and Biogeochemical Cycling. So for people who aren't familiar with terms like karst, Veda Zone, could you just tell us briefly what those mean and why they're important? Yeah, so karst is in general, any landscape that dissolves. So things like limestone, gypsum, those are really common karst formers. And it's more of a landscape. So it's not just cave formations. It can be sinkholes where you have sinking streams. Um, it's all of these different things that come together to form this landscape in which these caves form. The Veda zone in general is the section of the bedrock that is not fully saturated. So there's kind of two areas. There's the Veda zone and there's the Phreatic zone. So the Veda zone means that the pore space isn't fully saturated. 
and the phreatic zone means that the pore space is fully saturated. The reason that the Vedo zone is so interesting to us is because it's that connection between the surface and the aquifer that we use for drinking mm -hmm. water. But it's really important to understand what processes are going on in this Vedo zone, to be able to understand how things move from the surface down to aquifers. So how exactly does one monitor the Vedo zone in karst and what does that tell us? So one thing that's really awesome about karst is it forms caves. And so when we go into a cave, especially a cave that's not fully submerged, is in that Vedo zone, you're actually stepping into the Vedo zone of an aquifer. And so this gives us a lot of insights into how things are going through the Vedo zone. So if you think about it, a cave is just a really big pore space. And so we're, we're walking wow. in and we can do all of these different studies. And we do a lot of cave monitoring. And so we'll go through and we'll take atmospheric measurements. So one gas that's really important is carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide controls a lot of the carbonate equilibrium. So that controls how stalagmites form or how they don't form. And that also affects how huh? water will dissolve the bedrock around. So CO2 is really important for us to study, but we'll also study things like relative humidity, which, af which affects several different proxies in different ways, especially like oxygen isotopes. The way that the water will evaporate can affect how the signal is preserved in stalagmites. We also do a lot of drip collections. So the actual stalagmites are forming from drips. And so we'll collect that initial water that's forming that. And then finally, one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing are collecting modern stalagmites. And the way that we do that is we'll go to where water is dripping and we create these basically 10 by 10 centimeter or four by four inch. They're these glass plates that we sandblast. The reason that we sandblast them is because it forms basically a rough stalagmite surface. And so we'll go and we'll place this out underneath one of the drips. And every time that a drip hits, it's going to form a little bit of that calcite that forms that stalagmite. And we can take oh. those back to the lab and we can analyze them. So we can do things like, okay, how much calcite grew this month or over two months? What kind of chemical signals are being preserved in them? So what do our trace metals look like? What do our oxygen isotopes look like? And what we can do is we can start to use this modern calcite to calibrate our past records. So we spend a lot of time going through and we say, okay, let's say it was really hot and it was really dry. We can go and we can say, okay, what was the chemical signals being preserved in this calcite? And then when we go and we start looking through our stalagmites, we can say, okay, I see this chemical signature that looks just like I saw last month when it was really hot and really wet. So I can start to piece together a lot of the paleoclimate stuff with a context of the modern setting. Wow, that's super cool and super exciting and encouraging for, you know, students out there wondering, is this all figured out or are there new developments helping us learn more? Well, there's clearly brand new developments, Always. very recent, helping us learn more. So, you know, any students interested in this research out there, go see this session. But last couple of questions. What's like the main takeaway you hope participants get out of the field trip and the topical session? And you both can answer for the session and the field trip respectively. I think for the field trip, you know, hopefully there's a range of people as in previous field trips. There are some, we hope some of the world's experts on caves come on this trip, right? See what we're doing, interact with us. And in real time, you know, usually you have to wait until you submit a paper for publication before you get the experts reviewing it. But we, yeah. Alex and I would love to have the experts like, look at it now, right? Before we actually uh, submit this for public. Tell us, tell us midstream, give us your ideas. What is unique about this that you could learn and take away for your research that might lead to some collaborative efforts, which it has. People from other countries have seen what we do in these caves. And then when they're putting together their papers, they're comparing it to what we have. So it engenders research collaborations and shares knowledge with experts. But then at the other end of the spectrum, which is all good, are people who may be have, are interested, but have never been in a cave before, yeah. or are geologists, right? And I think every geologist should go into a cave at some point in their career. But I think to just gain an appreciation for just how cool they are. It, they're awesome. They're beautiful. We'll yeah. hopefully turn the lights off at one point so everyone appreciates what it's like to be in total yeah. darkness. Hopefully people gain appreciation for the, the fragileness of these environments and that we have to always be thinking about how can we sustain these environments because of how rare and important they are. Yeah. And for the topical session, uh, Cars Vedos monitoring in general is relatively understudied. And there's only really a few pockets of people 
that seem to be working on this. Like when I go and I look at the literature, some people are interested in biogeochemical cycling. So they're interested in understanding how do microbes, how do root zones, how does all of these different things affect the, the Vedas zone. But as a paleoclimatologist, I'm also interested in that, but I don't necessarily think about that a lot. So just bringing a lot of different perspectives together to instill, you know, collaborative efforts is kind of the whole idea of this topical session. There are people in academia, there are people that are in industry, there are people in government. We want to bring all of those people together to kind of build up the, the field. You know, we want to bring the field together. We want to, we want everybody to be able to know each other and to be able to know what each other are working on so that we can progress this field relatively quickly because there's a lot of issues. Absolutely. The collaboration part of things is such a big part of GSA Connects. And so how can students get involved in, in this research? Go to the caves. You don't have to go along with a PhD level researchers into a cave. You just, a lot of these tourist caves have really good, well-informed tours. They talk with us about our results and they are actually helping disseminate our results to the general public in terms of, you know, how fast do these things grow? How old is it? How can you tell something about the uh, past climate. So yeah, go into a cave. There's nothing like seeing something in the field. Yeah. One other thing you could do if you're really interested, go to a meeting, say like the Geological Society of America conference coming up in San Antonio this October, sign up for a field trip, go to a topical session and actually go up to talk to some of these researchers who you think are doing research that's in line with where your interests are. Don't be shy about meeting them. Then you'll be like me when I was uh, when I was a teenager. I would never go up to an adult and <laughs> ask them about their research, or whatever. They, I would say, don't be like me. Go up and talk to these scientists, these researchers. Find out how you could do more and get involved. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I my first few conferences, I was very nervous to go up and talk to people. But now that I've done more of it, I've learned that everybody that I've talked to, especially in the geosciences, is just so excited to talk about what they research. So, I mean, it's never it's never a lose situation. You're always going to win from That's that because they just want to tell you about it. And if you want to hear about it, you know, it's the perfect place to be is, is at these conferences. Your only regret may be if you do all of that is that uh, you may not be able to get us to stop talking about it. So. <laughs> true. That's absolutely true. So, you know, risk versus reward. <laughs> right. Right. Thank you guys so much Thank for coming you. on. Thank you, Thank Rachel. You.